But your brothers and elders and sisters in Islam, one time a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he was sitting and he asked him the most interesting question. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam many years before, more than 20 years before this question, he was already instructed by Allah, وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ That if someone comes to ask you a question, doesn't matter how irrelevant, doesn't matter how the, how the question seems to be, whether it's at the right time, the wrong time, whether it's being repeated over and over again, O Prophet of Allah, never make someone who's asking a question feel uncomfortable. And if this advice was just taken by all parents when their children keep asking them, are we there yet? Are we there yet? How far are we? And if parents or the questions are asked over and over and again and you're not making your children, you just ask that question. Just stay quiet in the back. If we, if we took the prophetic approach towards the sa'il, the one who's asking, which is la tanhar, don't make them feel uncomfortable. Make them feel comfortable. Go ahead, ask whatever you want. So this person comes and asks a question which is very interesting. And I... I don't have any factual evidence for this, but I do believe that most, I'm from America, so I'm not going to talk about Canadians, that maybe we're from the lineage of this person who asked the question, because maybe we would have asked the same question. He goes to the Prophet and he says, Ansuhni wa awjiz. Literally, you know, we put it into context. This man walks up to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we would give up anything in our life to spend a second with him. Anything in this world. And we're all, anyone sitting in this masjid would say that. Imagine you have a moment with him, and in that moment, you tell him, O oh, Prophet of Allah, give me advice, make it concise. I don't have time. Ansuhni wa ujiz. Give me advice, but make it concise. And this seems as if American, like we don't, we don't have more than, more capacity to listen in 10, 10, 15 minutes, to make it concise. So what can I share with you in 15 minutes the Prophet ﷺ, first of all, he did not even need to say a single word. Just his presence was enough to advise people. If the Prophet ﷺ never said a single word in his entire life, just the sight of his was enough for someone to transform their life. Just looking at his beautiful face was enough to change your life. Abdullah bin Salam, he says, I decided that I was not going to accept Islam. But everyone told me, this, this is a Muhammad, Muhammad, وسلم, he's coming from Mecca. I said, let me go give him a shot. Let me go see him. Let me go see how he looks. He says, Wallahi, the moment I looked at his face, anna He said, I was convinced that this face is not the face of a liar. Tufail bin Amr al who was told by the people of Mecca, be careful, you're very smart. You're a leader of your tribe. This man in Mecca right now, oof, he's a magician. He's a fortune teller. He's a poet. He casts spell on people. He said, if he's that bad, then I'm going to put cotton swabs in my ear. I'm not going to even risk the chance of me exposing myself to hear the words of the Prophet unintentionally. So I'm going to put cotton swabs in my ear the whole time I'm here. Three days he lived there. On the third day he was in Mecca doing tawaf of the Kaaba. And he saw the beautiful face of the Prophet ﷺ. And the moment he saw it, he said, who are, who are you? He said, this is Muhammad ﷺ. Ma'indaka ya Muhammad. What do you have to offer? A few moments later, he accepted Islam. Brothers and sisters, today we don't even, when we go to Medina Munawwara, what feeling do we have the moment we step into the city? The moment we see the green dome. You know, I said a lot of Arabic at the beginning of the khutbah. But there's an Urdu poet, Iqbal Azim, who is, a, who is blind. And this blind man is saying, Jaisi hi sabz gumbad nazar aayega. Bandagi ka karina badal jayega. Sar jukane ki fursat milegi kise. Khud hi palkoon se sajde tapak jayenge. He says, the moment I see, he can't even see. He says, the moment my eyes fall upon the green dome, in principle, I should actually fall in sajda doing shukr to Allah that, oh Allah, thank you for allowing me to come here and visit the blessed city of the Prophet ﷺ. But, oh Allah, forgive me, I can't do that. But, oh Allah, my eyes are fixated on this masjid, on this beautiful city. 
Yahan hai manzil qadam qadam par. You know, sometimes you go on a journey. We just came from Detroit. So your destination is Mississauga. But imagine a city of Medina where every step is your destination. Every step. This is where the Prophet sat. This is where Prophet, the Prophet ate. This is where he rested. We're going to that city. He says, the moment I see the green dome, I should be falling in sajda. But, oh Allah, my tears that are coming down my eyes are falling in sajda out of gratitude towards you. So we feel a transformative feeling the moment we walk into the city. But imagine walking into the city and seeing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So the Prophet did not have to say much. كَانَ سُكُوتُهُ أَكْثَرُ مِنْ كَلَامِهِ the Prophet's silence was far more than his speech anyways. That's the way he operated. That's, how, that's the way he lived. The people would just see him, sit with him. The Sahaba were asked, how, are, how is it so that you people have reached such a lofty status? And the people after you, they can do more. They can do more ibadah. They can do more sadqa. They can do more everything. But they can never reach your level. They would just reply, He said, we, we actually saw those beautiful faces. I saw Abu Bakr. I saw Umar. I saw the Prophet. It's different when you see. And that sight of theirs changes your life. So the Prophet did not have to give any advice, but he gave it anyways. So for him to give advice in a concise manner was very, very easy. Because Allah gave him the miracle of saying so much with such less words. So the Prophet ﷺ then gave him three advices, which I share with you today. First he said, My friend, أَجْمِعِ الْيَأْسَ مِمَّا فِي عِدِ النَّاسِ my friend, never expect anything from anyone. Anyone. Unequivocally. Don't have expectations from your friends. Don't have expectations from your children. Don't have expectations from each other. Why? Because everybody is weak. Only Allah is strong. Everybody is dependent. Only Allah is independent. I used to hear my mother making this dua since I was as a child, and I never understood what, she, what, what dua she's making. She used to say, Oh Allah, hame kisi muhtaj ke muhtaj na Oh Allah, never make me dependent on someone who's dependent. Ya ayyuhan nasu antum al fuqara'u ilallah, wallahu al ghani al hamid. Oh people, you are all faqeer. Faqeer in, in Arabic doesn't mean the same in Urdu. Faqeer in Arabic means the one who is, whose spinal cord is fractured. And those were, you know, we know what that means. When, when that happens, you're paralyzed. You're depending on others. You can't do anything for yourself. Allah is saying, all of us are dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe we don't see it right now because we're walking and talking, but as you, babies, you can see it in babies. They don't have, لَيْسَ لَكَ سِنٌ تَفْلَقْ وَلَيْسَ لَكَ دَرَسٌ تَطْحَنْ وَلَيْسَ لَكَ يَدٌ تَبْطِشْ وَلَيْسَ لَكَ رِجْلٌ تَمْشِ the, the children, they don't have, their hands don't have the strength to grasp. Their feet don't have the strength to walk. Their jaws don't have the strength to chew. They don't have teeth to eat with. So they're very dependent on someone who's taking care of them. Allah is saying, throughout your life, you're just like that baby, but you don't realize. Maybe you can walk here. Maybe you can drive here. But if you put yourself in that shoes, you are that baby. That is 100% dependent. And Allah says, if you forget that, then look at the three phases of life. When you're an infant and when you're an old age. Allah says in Surah Yasin, the one who we prolong their life, then their, their health starts deteriorating. Then you start seeing people going to Turkey as you get older. No 15 year old kid is going to Turkey to put it, get hair. You start seeing, before I was sitting on the floor, now I'm sitting on a chair. Before my jump shot was perfect, now I can't get off the ground. And slowly, the only difference is, when you were a baby, your mother was pushing you in a stroller. When you're old, your child is pushing you in a, in a, in a wheelchair. Both are getting pushed. But throughout our life, we're also being taken care of. So Allah tells us to look at these two phases. So the Prophet is saying, don't expect anything from anyone. Don't expect anything. Don't expect someone to, to thank you. Don't expect someone, you did, the, the, people, the brothers and sisters in Isna are known for their volunteer work. You volunteer at Isna, you do something at the masjid. If the expectation is that Sheikh Abdullah Idris or one of the scholars are going to sit with me and they're going to thank me, they're going to acknowledge me, the Prophet is telling us, don't do that. Because anytime you expect something, you will always be disappointed. And anytime you accept, you will always be happy. So just change expect to accept. 
Just change. The Prophet is telling us in a beautiful manner. You're at a wedding and you're expecting someone to come and give you a gift. That person comes, the expectation is that person's gonna give you from America, he's gonna give me 100 US dollars. But he comes and he gives you 10 Canadian dollars. Okay, we, that's why the prophets were human beings because they lived in that community. They understood what's happening in those communities. So someone now gives you 10 Canadian dollars. That guy still gave you $10. But the problem is you were expecting something else. And that expectation makes you ungrateful makes you lose appreciation. And that is one thing that we cannot afford, that is we don't have gratitude. With expect, when you have expectation, that loses gratitude and appreciation. So, don't expect anything from anyone, don't expect anything from this world. Because the only matloob that is worthy of being, the one that we want to work for, struggle for, sacrifice for is Allah. And Allah is in Allah laqawiyun amin. Allah is strong. So those who those who seek Him, will, Allah will give them strength as well. The people of Gaza are seeking what? The people of Gaza are seeking the pleasure of Allah. The people of Gaza are seeking the liberation of Aqsa. The people of Gaza are seeking martyrdom. Yes, the whole world is against them, but they're strong. They're strong because they have Allah. They get strength from Him. It's not like they have eight foot bodies and they eat more than us, they sleep more than us. No. They eat the same food much less. They sleep in much less place. If I came here, if I came here right now directly for and didn't sleep for 24 to 48 hours and I had to give a khutbah, I couldn't even give a khutbah. And these people operate much better and more efficient than this. With less sleep, with less food, with loss of loved ones. Wallahi, we my, my youngest brother three and a half years ago passed away, Rahmatullah Ali. He was 22 years old. Wallahi Ladim, us brothers and family who have a house, who have parents, who have food, who have friends, we could not operate for months after we buried him. How is it possible that the people of Gaza continue to operate even though they bury loved ones after loved ones, one after the other? You know why? Because the, 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 the conversations there is different. When my brother passed away, a Palestinian came to my dad, my dad's a physician, and he says to him, Doc, La, you know, should I tell you something? He's the one who informed my father about his son leaving this world. You know how difficult that is to tell a parent that? That your son has passed away? It's the, it's the, may Allah never put us in that position. To hear and to see the reaction of a mother and a father. It's a very difficult position to be in. But you know how he told my father? He said, in Palestine, this is how we tell, pe- this is how we tell people about these situations. La adri, amnu hanik, amnu azik. He said, oh, oh, oh doctor, I'm not sure if I should congratulate you or should I give you condolences. Congratulations, you're the father of a shaheed. Khalas, it changes everything. Because that gives you strength now. That I know I'm the father of a shaheed, I'm the mother of a shaheed. So the Prophet is saying, don't do that. If you expect things from people, it will make you weak. But if you only expect from Allah, it will give you strength. The strength that you need to go through life. So that's the first thing. The second advice he gave, لا تتكلم بكلام تعتذر منه غدا. He said, my friend, don't say anything today that you will have to apologize for tomorrow. Don't. Restrain yourself. Words hurt. The wounds of a sword, the wounds of a blow, they can be healed. ولا يلتام ما جرح اللسان. But a word, the words, the, the wounds of words, they're, hard, they're harder to heal over time. So restrain yourself. Don't just say something. And this is a beautiful lesson for all of us. لا تتكلم بكلام تحت Think about it a hundred times. And one of our teachers would tell us, if you're going to say something that is, might be rude and might be okay, neutral, don't ever text it. Don't ever put it in words. You can say it in person because a person can take it the wrong way. The things that you have to say in text or emails has to be 100% a positive thing. Even then, a spouse can take it the wrong way. Where are you? Why are you asking me where I am? Like someone can take it the wrong way. They, in their mind, they already have the, the dialect. Like they have it in their own dialect. You're asking me, where am I? One is, where are you? There's a whole different story. That's why qawl hasan is not just a beautiful word, but it's also putting it in a beautiful way. It's not just saying beautiful thing. It's not beautiful word in a beautiful manner. The Prophet's saying, don't do that. When my brother passed away, 
we go back on our phones and we look at our messages between each other. Wallahi, if your loved one passes away and you're going back and looking at messages and those messages are rude to each other, you will really regret it. And now there's no way to apologize. I've seen many people come to the graves of their loved ones and I ask them, what are you doing? Read Fatiha. And most of the time they're just saying, I'm sorry. They're apologizing too late. Look at this message I sent to him right before he passed away. I said, I don't want to see your face again. Why did you say that for? Don't do that. The Prophet said, لا تتكلم بكلام تعتذر منه غدا. Don't ever say something that you will apologize for tomorrow. However, brothers and sisters sitting here, if someone apologizes to you, you have an obligation to forgive them. The Prophet said, من لم يقبل عذر أخيه لم يرد عليه الحوض. The Prophet said that if someone apologizes to you for something and you don't accept their apology, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't dare come to my pond on the Day of Judgment. That they apologize to you. It takes humility to apologize. So once they apologize, you don't have to become friends with them, but you accept their apology. Second advice. The third advice, and I conclude with this, and it's a beautiful conclusion. وَإِذَا قُمْتَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَصَلِّ صَلَاةَ مَوَدَّعِينَ the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Oh my friend, the translation is, I'll say the translation first and then I'll explain it. He said, when you stand for salah, stand as if this is the last salah you will ever pray in your life. What does that mean? He basically is saying, cherish every moment. And the way you cherish every moment is you believe that, that, this, that this moment will never come again. You soak it in. How does a father and mother walk into the hospital room of their child who has stage 4 cancer and the physicians have told the family that we have to pull the plug? Go and sit with him or stand with him. You have a few minutes left. Unfortunately, I'm sure the sheikh sitting in front of me has been in these situations more than we want to be in. You walk into the room, the father's standing there, the mother's standing there, the mother who gave birth to this child, the sister, the cousins, and they believe that this is the last time we will ever see our loved one in this life. Are they on their phones? Are they talking to each other? Are they checking the scores? Are they looking on the social media? They're fixated on that person to such a point where they can even observe, oh, I said this and he moved his eyes. Because they're, so, they're observing every single thing. Because they are taking this moment as a last moment. And Abdullah ibn Abbas used to say, when he was asked, how did you attain so much knowledge? He says, half of my knowledge was through asking good questions and the other half was through keen observation of the Prophet ﷺ. Keen observation. The Prophet ﷺ used to have three vessels under his bed. One vessel was used for wudu. One vessel was used to use the restroom. One vessel was used for drinking water. All three vessels looked exactly the same. All three vessels had almost the same amount of water. Abdullah ibn Abbas who as a nine-year-old child observes this practice of the Prophet at night. He could have been sleeping at night. He observes all these things. And one night the Prophet goes to the restroom. Subhanallah. He comes out, this nine-year-old child According to some narrators, he was even eight years old. He's standing there with the vessel. The Prophet looks at him. He sees the right vessel for wudu. So he observed the right one. He observed the right time. So he realized what time the Prophet wakes up. He didn't, Ya Rasulullah, so what time do you wake up? No, no, that's not, you don't have to ask the question. You just observe. And the third thing he observed was how much water he uses. So the right vessel, the right time, and the right amount of water. The Prophet, upon seeing this observation of this child, at that very moment, the Prophet made dua for him. Allahumma faqihu fiddin wa allimu ta'wil. Oh Allah, make him the greatest alim of this ummah and make him the greatest faqih, the jurist of this ummah, mufassir of this ummah. And this right here is not asking for dua. This is earning dua. There's a difference. One is you ask someone for dua. It's a beautiful thing. One is you earn someone's du'a. You ask parents whose children become hafid and alim. 
You know, we're young people. We, we are no one to make this claim, but living in America, my mother and my father, they were physicians. So you, at that time, there was no school. You, I asked my mother once, I said, I mean, like, how do you think a lot of parents ask me tips for, you know, how to, how to be a good parent and what should we do and what should we not do? So can you just, you know, how, what should I tell them? Give me some advice that how did you do it? Five children, half of the alim and one shaheed. And he, she said, very simple. This was the result of earning other people's du'as. Serve them. Serve them. Be there for them. Help them. What do you think they're going to do? They can't give back to you. They'll make du'a for you. And their du'as are, there's a higher chance of their du'a being accepted for your children than your own du'as. So this observation, when the Prophet is saying, when you stand for salah, Pray as if this is your final salah. What happens when you do that in life? Right now you're sitting in front of me. This, wallahi, could be the last time we ever see each other. And no one can say it can't be. This, if we come for Jummah khutbah every single week and we convince ourselves that this could actually be the last time I hear a khutbah, you will observe the khatib more. You will pay more attention. You will benefit more. Similarly for the khatib himself. If I come here, we do the same thing. If we go out to eat dinner with my wife or my husband, we're eating at a restaurant, we're waiting for the food. Imagine this could be the last minute time you see your spouse. I don't think we'll be on our phones. I think we'll be looking at each other, talking to each other. We will lose this whole disorder of people who are present, but they're absent-minded. Uh, this plague that has uh, enveloped the entire ummah where there are present people but they're absent-minded. And the only way to solve that problem is to follow the hadith of Prophet ﷺ. Make this moment a moment that you cherish because it could be the last moment of your life. It could be the last moment. I'll conclude with this. One of my students, he was a youngster at that time, I took him to uh, Medina Munawwara for Umrah. And we got into Rawdud al-Jannah. This place where you, this beautiful place where, may Allah take all of us there over and over again. So we get there, and I, I tell, this is the first time coming, I tell him ahead of time, I said, we have to get there, any dua you make there, Allah accepts. So we get there, he's standing next to the hujrat of the Prophet on the left hand side, so you can see the Prophet's room, right there. And I'm standing next to him on this side. Right before he starts praying, he raises his hands. He was probably 18 years old at the time, he raised his hand and said, Oh Allah, I beg you, take my soul in this salah. Oh Allah, I beg you, I want to die in this salah. I beg you, oh Allah, I'm not asking you for anything else. Now, I'm standing next to him. I'm married to his sister. I said, this guy better survive. I have to take him back. But I'm not going to tell him that, brother, don't make that dua. That's between him and Allah. So I'm, he kind of messed up my salah. I said, well, this man has to go back with me. And so he, he starts praying. He, alhamdulillah, he survived. He's an alim now. He's, he still lives with us. He prayed salah. After he prayed salah, we went to the hotel. He's in the hotel. He's saying, man, I made dua. Allah didn't accept it. So now I'm telling him, Allah's going to accept your dua. Inshallah you'll die in Medina. Which is not the time. Allah's going to give you more work to do. I'm telling him this whole, the workshop of the delay of acceptance of dua. I'm giving it to him right there. But then I really wanted to ask him a question. So when he was done asking his questions, I said, Habibi, tell me how that salah was. Because he was convinced, he was very naive. And he was convinced that any dua he makes at that moment will be accepted. So I said, Habib, tell me how that prayer was. And he said, Shaykh, the moment I started, I thought I was going to die. And then I went in Ruku, I was like, Malikul Mawt is coming right now. And I was like, I'm waiting, how is he going to look? Where is my soul going to leave from? I heard it's going to leave from my feet. Got up, sajda, and like this, my entire salah was in anticipation for Malikul Mawt. This is how Sahaba prayed salah every day. This is how people of Gaza pray salah, fajr, every single day. They're praying taraweeh different than us. They're praying taraweeh, they can hear drones all over them. They could die right there. But do you think they want to die while praying a salah that is not full, in, uh, a salah that is acceptable to Allah? Or they're praying a salah, which Allah, oh Allah, I'm praying this last salah. When the people, the sahaba, Zayd bin Dathina, 
Allah when they're, they're, they, or Saeed bin Jubair, when he told Hajjaj, let me just pray two rakat salah before I leave this world. And he prays two rakat salah. He makes it a little fast. He said, oh, Hajjaj, wallahi, I knew this is my last two rakats. If it was up to me, I would have delayed them. But if I delayed them, you would think I'm afraid of death. That's why I made them quick. So, this ajmi'al yasmi ma fi nas. Don't expect anything from anyone. Accept, don't expect. Number two, don't say anything that you'll have to apologize for. Restrain our tongues. Restrain our words. And number three, cherish every moment by believing this is the last moment. Every khutbah, every speech, every salah, every moment with your spouse, every moment with your children, don't take it for granted. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to live our life like this. May Allah give victory for the people of Gaza. May Allah give us a life in which, a life that we can live that is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah give us a death that we will go through in this life that will be an honorable death that will give us comfort to our families, that will give us elevation in Jannah. Oh Allah, oh Allah, forgive our sins. Oh Allah, the people of Gaza who are suffering for so many months, oh Allah, in our lifetime, oh Allah, you help them. And let us pray salah and a masjid of Aqsa that is liberated. Oh Allah, the brothers and sisters who are helping and supporting all the masajid, especially the masjid that we're sitting in today, oh Allah, it's not, oh Allah, oh Allah, help them and support them and support all the Muslims who are suffering all over the world. Wa akhuda'un, alhamdulillah, alameen.